This video is supported by Skillshare. Hey, Peter, what's happening? You got a minute? Yeah, sure. Well, I just came back from the hyena meeting. Yeah, how'd that go? Oh, it was going great. Until I got to the pages you gave me. You copied the male part onto the female part. What? Look, I know you've designed like a million penises at this point. I'm sure it gets super repetitive, but dude, I need you to make like just a bare minimum of effort here. How do you think that made me look in the meeting? <sighs> hey, Jimmy, I'm sorry you had a bad meeting, but um, I didn't copy anything. This is, this is what they wanted. The female has the penis. Yep. Is that in the original creative brief? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little weird, but that's what they wanted. I mean, do you have it? Can I see it? Yeah, um, uh, no. Uh, Sandra took it. Sandra took it. Yeah. Wait, okay, so if, if the female has a penis, does the male give birth? Is this like a seahorse situation? No, the female gives birth. Through the penis? <laughs> yeah. Why? I mean, uh, mysterious ways. I mean, hyenas, they're goofballs. Look at these guys. I mean, I don't know. All right, fine. If that's what they want upstairs, then we'll do that. But we got to call it a pseudo penis or something because you can't give birth through a penis. Yeah, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Do you have any more designs while I'm here? Yeah, they're at the door. Cool. Oh, uh, what, what day is that from? Tuesday? Uh, it's probably fine. What? <laughs> I, uh, I may have dropped acid that day. At work? No. Before I came in. This ought to be interesting. <laughs> Coyotes are native to North America, and they play an important part of our ecosystem. They travel in packs, and they're very social animals with an advanced communication system. And they have a big, long history of intermingling with wolves. And maybe it's this interspecies scootily pooping that is the reason why coyotes, even though they're smaller than wolves, have really big impacts on the environment. This video is not about coyotes, although longtime viewers know what I'm referring to here. Yes, in the video where I celebrated a million subs on this channel, my team of clones came up with some interesting video topics. How astronauts poop. Deadliest orgies of all time. Coyote penises. Well, we've already done a video on one of those topics, so, uh... Here's another one. Sort of. Is there enough about coyote penises to make a whole video out of? <laughs> you have no idea. Turns out, no, there's not. Not about coyote penises specifically, but penises in general? <laughs> That's a subject that goes deep. Because sexual reproduction is how we all got here. The mixing of genes has been essential for genetic diversity and evolution, and nature's been experimenting with different ways of doing that for billions of years. So today, let's take a look at the various methods nature's come up with to insert tab A into slot B. This could get weird. By the way, this, this may go without saying, but for all of you out there who send me emails about how you like to watch my videos with your kids, um, you might want to set this one out. Or don't, they're your kids. Screw them up however you want. Let's start by stepping way back and talk about the fundamentals of sexual reproduction so that we can understand how things got so weird. In sexual reproduction, a haploid female gamete, or egg cell, mixes with a male haploid gamete, or sperm cell. And this fusion creates a diploid zygote. Uh, diploid means that the chromosomes are paired. And what this does is it creates an organism with a distinctly different set of genes than its parents. On the other hand, asexual reproduction doesn't require the combining of any genes or gametes. It's literally just a clone of the parent organism. Which seems like that would be easier. So why does nature go through so much trouble for this? Or maybe a better way of putting it is why has this method been more successful even though it requires more energy? 
One advantage is that it ensures that a particular species number of chromosomes stays the same throughout the generations. And of course, the other advantage is that it increases genetic diversity, increases the gene pool, and allows a species to adapt and change over time. There are two types of sexual reproduction. Syngamy, which is the internal or external fusion of haploid sex cells, most common type of reproduction in multicellular sexual populations. And conjugation, a temporary fusion to exchange micronuclear material, often seen in single cell organisms. Eukaryotes were the first organisms to engage in asexual reproduction around 2 billion years ago. Internal fertilization among vertebrates is much more recent on the evolutionary timescale. Paleontologists in the Australian desert discovered in 2008 the fossilized remains of a fish embryo that was still connected to its mother with an umbilical cord. This dated to around 380 million years ago. So that's how it started. Let's look at how it's going. First up is ducks. Gotta start with the ducks. So first of all, most bird species don't have penises at all. Uh, both sexes have a cloaca, and when a male bird loves a female bird very much, he'll rub his cloaca against hers and pass his sperm from his cloaca to hers. Heterosexual scissors, if you will. But ducks don't do scissors. Ducks use a different kitchen utensil. Corkscrews. So when ducks mate, they bond for a whole mating season, but often rival males will force themselves onto other females. I don't know if I need a trigger warning here or anything, but yeah, um, nature can be kind of rapey. So over evolutionary time, female ducks developed elaborate vaginas with dead-end cul-de-sacs and weird spiral formations. So consequently, over time, the male ducks developed big, weird, long, spiral-shaped penises with backward-facing spines and ridges so that they could further deposit their sperm into a female than their rivals could. So if you say that two ducks are screwing, that is a very literal statement. And if male duck dicks weren't weird enough, it turns out they are both growers and showers. Yeah, male ducks can actually respond to sexual competitors by growing an extra nub on the end of their penis, actually making it longer just to, uh, just to scare off any rivals. According to a study by Patricia Brennan of Mount Holyoke College, when a male is alone with a female, it would grow a normal-sized penis. But if other males were around, they grew larger penises so they could show females that they could deposit sperm further inside of her. Brendan told Scientific American in 2017, quote, So evolution must be acting on the ability to be plastic, the ability to invest only what is needed in your current circumstance. And the current circumstance of ducks apparently requires growing a giant corkscrew penis. Now let's talk about the sea slug. So something that stands out when looking at the world of sexual reproduction in nature is that it's not just about getting your sperm into a female, it's about keeping rival sperm out. Ducks manage this with corkscrews. Sea slugs have a different strategy. The Chromodorus reticulata is a type of sea slug found in the Pacific Ocean. And researchers believe that it may be the first creature known that can have sex repeatedly with a disposable penis. No, that's not just a Great King Missile song. Sea slugs are also known as nudibranches and are known to be simultaneous hermaphrodites. In other words, they have both the male and female genitalia, so when two sea slugs mate, one inserts its penis into the female uh, genitalia of the other sea slug and vice versa, so they can kind of impregnate each other. I wonder what the abortion issue would be like if that were the case for us. But anyway, Japanese researchers found something interesting, and they published their findings in the journal Biology Letters in 2013. They watched the slugs mate 31 times. After the... <sighs> Sorry. Sorry, I had so many jokes fly through my head, I just disassociated. Not with somebody's job to just sit there and watch the two horniest slugs on the planet just rail each other over and over and over and over and over. I don't care how bad your job is, that guy's job is worse. And apparently while watching these two nymphomaniacs go at it over and over, they noticed that each time they finished, they snapped their penises off into each other. Just snapped them right off. And then he wrote a report about it and went home to his spouse. So, how did your day go? I watched two sea slugs f 31 times. That's nice. They snapped their dicks off up there. Obviously, to do that 31 times means that you have to be able to regrow your penis, which they were able to do at least three times per 24 hours. And the slugs' penises had backward-facing spines on them. Uh, so the prevailing theory is that the first round was really they were just using their penis to remove any uh, leftover sperm from any competitors. The second penis is then used to insert its own sperm into the female, so uh, that ensures that it passes its genes along. As for the other 29 times, well, slugs are sluts. Next up is the anglerfish, from animals that lose their penises to animals that just become the penis. 
The male anglerfish has only one goal, and that is to attach itself to a female anglerfish and be with her for the rest of its life. But this isn't some romantic love story where they kiss in the rain as the credits roll. No, this, this was a romantic comedy directed by David Cronenberg. Yeah, go figure this fish would have the creepiest sex imaginable. So what happens with the anglerfish is that when a male finds a female that he likes, he walks up and approaches her, says hi, and then um, bites her side forever. He basically attaches himself to her and then over time his circulatory system merges with hers and then his eyes and internal organs disintegrate. What's left of him is basically a sexual parasite that provides sperm for the female whenever she wants it. He's basically a sperm pump. Female anglerfish are way bigger than their male counterparts, so they can actually attach up to eight males to them at a time. Males, collect them all. So yeah, this is super weird, but of course there's a reason for this, and that reason is food. At the depths these fish are swimming in, food is pretty scarce, so this not only provides her a mate for life, but it also cuts the food resources needed in half. It should also be noted not all anglerfish do this. There's like 300 species of anglerfish, and really only 25 of them do it this way. By the way, this is called sexual parasitism. They are literally sexual parasites. Again, so many jokes. All right, next up is eels. Eels kind of had a moment in the last year or so in the, in the weird sciences circles, uh, which is the thing I just made up. There were a lot of social media posts and videos going around about how we kind of don't know exactly how eels reproduce because we've never seen them do it and they don't seem to have any genitalia. That of course is not true. Scientists do know how they do it and they do have genitalia. You just have to dissect them to find it. But that does not change the fact that it is still very, very weird. First of all, they have a complicated life cycle, starting as larvae drifting in the Sargasso Sea, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The larvae look like transparent willow leaves, and they travel along ocean currents. The American eel drifts westward, the European eel drifts eastward. By the way, we have no idea how they know which way to drift, they just apparently do. When they reach land, they become glass eels, and then they do something that very few animals can do. They move into freshwater and become freshwater eels, which are known as yellow eels. These are the eels most people eat, by the way. And then these yellow eels live for a really long time, like 85 years, assuming they don't wind up on some sushi. But whenever the eel decides it's time to end its life, it goes through a fourth transformation into what are called silver eels. And by the way, this is why it was so hard to figure out how they reproduce for a long time, because they always thought that these were four separate species. So it becomes a silver eel and swims back out to the Sargasso Sea, where they started from. This can take up to a year, and their bodies continue to change along the way. They don't eat for the whole journey, in fact their stomachs dissolve, its eyes change, and it develops sexual organs. So after living for 85 years, they finally become sexually mature. And by the way, if they don't go back out to the Sargasso Sea, this change doesn't occur. They can technically live indefinitely as yellow eels. Maybe that's the key to immortality, just don't develop sex organs. But why the Sargasso Sea? Why is that the only place they can do that? How do they even know how to get there? Uh, seriously, I'm asking. Nobody seems to know. So some theories include water temperature and salinity for why they go there. And as for how they get there, they sometimes say it's electromagnetic fields or scent that brings them there. Also, one more weird thing. Uh, eel's sexuality, whether it becomes a male or a female, is dependent on its environment. Like, they're all kind of the same before the environment changes them. Anyway, once they reach the Sargasso Sea, that's where they finally mate and then eventually die. Um, we still don't know exactly how the mating takes place. It's thought that it's probably uh, external mixing of clouds of sperm and eggs in the ocean, but we've never seen it. So yeah, it's still a bit of a mystery. My bet is that it's even weirder than that, because of course it would be. Frickin' eels. So this is just a short list. There are actually many other weird animal species that we could explore. Just a few of the standouts that I mentioned real quick. There's the echidna with its four-headed penis. The dolphin, with a penis that can grab, grope, and swivel like a human hand. The barnacle, whose penis is nearly eight times its body length, which it uses to reach out to nearby mates. Insects of the Neotrogla genus, where the males have a vagina-like pouch with a sperm, and the females have a penis-like organ that penetrates the male and collects the sperm. And the Argonaut octopus, a cephalopod whose penis detaches itself from the creature's body and swims around looking for a lady. Kind of a torpedo penis there. But of course a cephalopod would make it on this list because cephalopods are really crazy, which is why I did a video on cephalopods a while back, which by the way is one of the greatest achievements of scientific entertainment that's ever existed. It should have been put on the Voyager record, which, what, what, why is this on? Oh, did Jason write this one? He got me. He got me again, that scamp. Jason. 
But anyway, sexual reproduction basically comes down to taking genetic material from a male and genetic material from a female and mixing it up. And as we've discussed in this video, there's no one way of doing that. So no matter how kinky you think you are, nobody's as creative in the sex department than nature. But if you're creative in other ways, why not make a career out of it? And if you need a little help in that direction, you might want to check out the course Finding Fulfillment Using Pivots to Power Your Creative Career on Skillshare. Hosted by best-selling author Emma Gannon, this class is all about how to make a career pivot from the safe thing that might just pay the bills if you're lucky, to the dream career that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and feel empowered in your life. Even if you don't quite know what the next move might be, she'll walk you through some exercises that'll point you in the right direction and give specific, actionable tasks to get you started on your journey. She also speaks to three professional creatives on how they made their career leaps that changed their lives. This, of course, is just one of hundreds of courses you can take on Skillshare covering design, marketing, social media, photography, music, video production, as well as productivity courses, which we could all use help with. Skillshare's online classes are super affordable at only $10 a month, but the first thousand people to sign up at my link below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. So shake things up, try something new. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the channel members that are helping to support this channel, forming an awesome community, just being cool people. I say it every time and I mean it. Uh, I got some new people I need to talk about. Uh, murder the names real quick. We got Joe Potter, Tun618, Foster Wolf, Adra Lindstrom, Abra Lindstrom, sorry, Daryl Sauce, Will and Denise Barnes, Bronwyn Ellen Kaiser, Will, Kim Alexander Schroeder, Emily Kodatek, <laughs> Renette Gaskill, Edmund Rains, Riley Sequoia, In Anime Intellect, Sean Gonzalez, Louise Glure, Sue Bonner, Grayson, and Fail Catscan. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams, and again, just be a part of an awesome community with our Discord and all that kind of stuff as well, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. There's not as many penises in that one, uh, but Google thinks you might like it. There's other uh, videos down here on the side if you're watching YouTube that have my face on. You can go check those out, and if you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And I think that's it for now. Um, thanks for watching this, and, and, and uh, this is probably gonna be demonetized, so any kind of Patreon help would be appreciated, so. <laughs> but uh, that's it for now. Uh, you guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.